I don't know how it works in the rest of the world, but in New York, we break the ice with what do you do? I've gotten the impression that's not the case everywhere, but that's what I want to know about. My favorite conversations are the ones where you encounter somebody who's really specialized at something who inevitably gets to the point where they're like, I don't want to bore you or not to get technical. And then directly after that, if you break them down, you get to the good shit. That's where that's, I love it. I love hearing an expert or a wonk or uh, somebody with really niche interest or ability or skill or whatever it is, just get going and drop a whole bunch of words and phrases I don't understand and give me a little window into what it's like to do something at a really high level in a really specialized way. That's the idea with this show. I'm going to try to get people talking like they talk when there are no norms around. Uh, and and, and for, my, for my first guest, I got a food scientist, this guy named Cody Masters. I met him at a wedding. The conversation that he and I had was the germ for this show because he said he was a food scientist and not even knowing what the hell he meant by that. I immediately asked him something about sous vide and like 20 minutes later, my mind was blown. Uh, I had a whole litany of new things and and, and new questions to ask and and just uh, a whole world opened up to me. And years later, I was still thinking about that conversation. I was thinking like, how can I bottle that lightning? So this first episode, I'm talking to Cody, who, for lack of a better word, is a food scientist. We'll get into that, why that term is tough uh, in the interview. Uh, and we get into exactly what he does. But the, the short of it is that Cody feeds tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people with recipes that are, are part industrial design in the sense that they're they're instructions for machines in a way and are part, uh, you know, chefery, food stuff, cookery. But uh, it's a pretty fascinating discipline that Cody's in and he's very uh aware of the the kind of challenges in the industry that he's in and he's aware of the perception of certain elements of his industry and he's he's got a he's got he's got integrity about it and he's an incredibly thoughtful guy and it's a very easy interview because all you got to do is basically hit record and the guy gives you gold so I'm really psyched that this is uh the first interview that I'm presenting here on nothing is boring I would love your feedback please reach out to me I'm Noah at Hard Work Party. That's on Instagram, on Twitter, Hard Work Party, at Hard Work Party, or hardwork.party is the website. And there's a form there, and you can write me, and you can find show notes there. Um, please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever service you listen to. Please tell a friend. Please give us five-star reviews. So I could really use the help getting out ahead of the haters who are coming. So please enjoy this episode. Stick around afterwards for a little extra something-something. And enjoy the interview, Cody. come to me and they'll say like, oh, you don't name like customers I've created things for. Oh, you still work for Costco. I'm like, no, I've never worked for Costco. I've created things that are sold in Costco or I've created things that are sold in Walmart or Sam's Club or Chili's or IHOP or Applebee's, things of that nature. The easiest way that I describe it to people is say like all these places have what they would call R&D, their research and development side. However, those companies would normally come to someone like me and say, Hey, we want to try something like this, or we're looking for fall themed items. We want a new flavor carnitas on our menu. And I'll come up with what I would imagine would fit their consumer base palette. And then if I take that and show that to their buyers, 
they might say, okay, of these few that you showed me, I really like this. Now we need to taste a little more of this or we want a little bit less of this. I go back and make the revisions and then I can bring it back to them. Now, underneath all of that is that industrial foundation that it has to be built upon because anything that I develop in my kitchen has to be able to very easily transfer to our, you know, call it a production facility where you have a combination of machine and human working you know, there's a synergy between the two to create things. So like our stuffed chicken breasts, th those are actually butchered by hand, the chicken themselves. And then the stuffing is mixed in our giant vacuum tumbler. And then that's stuffed into the chicken by hand. But then that's going through a machine that's, you know, packaging in an airtight container and that. Now, that's a that's a very clean side of it. You go more towards food service and food service in my lingo is restaurant. Then it gets a little bit more into the other side of what you were referring to, where it's, you know, there is a price point that has to be met. You're talking about companies that are sometimes looking at percentages of penny, pennies and, oh yeah, like it can just be something as simple as we want the visual to be differently. And so for every, let's say for every hundred gram sample, I want to add a gram of parsley flake and that's on the easiest, most generic level. We may show that to them and they say, oh, no, we can't afford that. And so I can only add a tenth of a percent to that same that the same pickup there for that same sample. And then they're like, OK, yeah, we can we can afford that. And so now we have a little bit of green. So it catches the eye. And it, it, there are so many different little things that come into play. Money is always a big one. I do really try to create everything without thinking about money. But. That's impossible when you're making things for a fast food restaurant versus, let's say, Costco in the Northern California region, which has a very developed palate and has a consumer base that's willing to spend more money on your grass fed beefs or your antibiotic free chicken or your you know, heirloom varietal you know, cheeses and vegetable blends and things like that, where I really can be a little bit more esoteric with my offerings and think about food on a more global level as opposed to other regions of the country or other customers who – it's broccoli and cheddar because that's that's the Midwest and that's what they want and that's what they appreciate and understand and that's what they're going to spend their money on. And so it's it's a trip, man, because coming out of restaurants in New York City and then moving back to California and taking a gig like this, you know, if a if a fast food restaurant comes to me or even crazier, like the U.S. prison system or school districts, you're designing things that. I mean, it's it's not even just percentage of, of ingredients it's percentages of what would be perceived as food to the normal person. And then there's a lot of other things that come into play where like you're really trying to hit a tight price point. And so that's where the terminology of the, you know, si isolated soy proteins and the textured vegetable protein and, you know, your MSG replacers to get more flavor. And then I mean, then you're just like falling down that rabbit hole of. I read these on the back of food that I buy, but I have no idea what I'm eating and I, I can't even pronounce these words. <laughs> Boy, so many things, so many questions. Um, right, let's just start taking apart all the different things. And I know these, what's, what's really fascinating about what you do to me is that it's in a certain sense, uh, a hybridization of, of a million different disciplines with a million different kinds of constraints on it. And they all come together to create a, a discipline that is not something you can categorize oh uh, no way at all yeah. as as art as science as oh dude i'm i'm a hybrid in this is going to sound kind of silly but i'm a hybrid in like a really insecure way because i've worked for people that i consider like the quote unquote proverbial like oh chef where i would say yes chef no chef I have so much respect for that terminology that and that title that it's hard for me to even tell people I'm a chef because that's how I see that word in my head and not this like bastardized, like every show on TV version of I'm a chef that works in a cafeteria. Well, no, you're not. That's just what people see that word as now. But then what do, what do I say then? Do I say I'm a scientist? I'm not a scientist. I went to UC Santa Barbara culinary school, became a nutritionist, but I mean, Cornell has a food science major. And so I took the most unorthodox path 
to even get to what I am doing right now. But it's this weird it, – I, I don't know, man. I'm good at what I do, and I'm, I'm totally comfortable saying that. It's just very, very strange anytime I'm in a setting with other people that do what I do because I am so unlike them and so abnormal to what the most generic sense of a food scientist or an executive chef would be because I never really – I've never really been in either field long enough to become comfortable and just be like, this is it. This is who I am. This is my identity. I sort of walk in this gray area of, hey, there aren't many of me in the world right now. But now food science is a major at so many colleges that in a decade, it's going to be like any other industry where it's just washed over with way too many applicants. And I don't think someone like me would ever stand a chance. And so it's it's weird to be at the forefront of this, this mass movement of, hey, this is what the millennial culture, which every single buyer, every person I ever meet with wants me to focus on the millennial trends. So us as millennials, we're all pushing this, this momentum in one direction to buy and eat a certain way. And everybody else is kind of trying to play catch up. But at the same time, you have the world of academia behind it that's just going to kind of be this giant wave that just washes over the top of it. And I, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like, you know, like I said, like a decade from now, it, it's going it, to I, I like I say with complete confidence, I won't be here. Someone like me will, will have to stay in restaurants or, you know, become a teacher or something like that, because they would never bring me in with the with the academic background that I have. That's very interesting. And honestly, like I honestly and I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not a, a trendy type or whatever, but I genuinely believe that machines will be making these recipes uh, in oh, the for sure. I mean, Watson, oh. uh, you know, for what, for whatever it's worth is already coming up with these insane recipes. Um, oh dude, they, there's, it's go to any convention. I mean, I, I serve or work or just peruse, you know, multiple conventions a year and every year, let's say for the last three or four years, you see more and more booths that are popping up that are just sort of showing, uh, you know, right where we're at with machines moving into, taking over so much. I mean, and a big part of it now is the fast food industry where, especially in, you know, the Bay area, San Francisco area, I already know there's restaurants that you walk into and you don't talk to anybody. You go up and you, you tell them what you want on the computer screen and then it gives you the food. Well, that's going to happen. That's going to happen everywhere. And I've seen some of the equipment that's already there, even just for like making French fries and it is all automated and it's, it's super cool. But for somebody who had his first job at 15 in a fast food restaurant, like I look back and I'm like, Oh man, this is just super weird. Like I, I don't feel old enough to look at this and be like, Oh damn, I, I'm going to be like a lost cause. <laughs> but, well, there's that. You know? I mean, there's the, there's the mechanical part of actually making the food, but I also mean like, I genuinely believe that uh, artificial intelligence, what we're calling it now will be yeah. doing your job. Uh, it, because not because your job is something that's, you know, in a certain sense lends itself to the simplicity of like writing an algorithm, uh, at all. And, and in fact, I think the, the, the kind of shine, the kind of brilliance of the new kind of machine learning systems that we have is that they're very good at taking over the jobs that you cannot explain that, that, you know, you as a person could never, could never explain to a computer how to do your job and no one ever could, but a computer could take all these different inputs these metrics for success and say like you know we've got all these kind of very very fine kind of granular price considerations we've got these very unknowable and kind of fickle and mercurial market considerations and we've got cooking which is a combination of chemistry and also this kind of art you know in a way in the same way that painting is in a certain sense that like the sum of the the whole the sum of the parts is is different from just adding uh, the components together. And that actually turns out to be the type of thing that artificial intelligence happens to be good at in certain circumstances. It's kind of like teaching someone to drive. Like you could never teach a computer to drive or play the game go, but as it turns out, computers can be really good at it. If you just tell them whether or not they're doing a good job and let them try. Uh, so I'm, I don't mean we're, we're starting off with like the end of the conversation here and, and you <laughs> yeah, already actually I got to my last I'm question. Out. I guess I'm just going to quit now. (laughs) Let's back up though, because my first question here after here's my guess at what you do is what kind of machines make the prepared food recipes that you 
uh, design for supermarkets and for uh, chain restaurants. Like in the in the factory side of things, uh, you mentioned a tumbler. Uh, I think your your LinkedIn says something about kettle manufacturing. Like what? Yeah, I would go with that. What are those kind of things? It's really interesting. It's kind of like when I hire a new kid to come in and work in my kitchen, I have to teach him my terminology, which is something I had to learn myself. It was a quite a surreal transition to going from restaurants to what I did because it's not something that's used even in a you know you can go to your biggest hotel kitchen and it wouldn't be there. Um, so a vacuum tumbler in the most generic sense is a giant cylinder that you would put ingredients in. So let's, let's say we're going with a raw marinated meat. So when I write a recipe now, I don't write a recipe in any way in which the average person would read it and understand what to do. I write a recipe in percentages and pickups. And so if I take, if I, if you ask me, Cody, give me a, very generic chicken fajita recipe. Okay, the first thing I would say is, what's your weight of meat? And you say, I have a pound. Okay, so to me, that's 453 grams. So if I take 453 grams, I know that to make a nice marinade and a nice tumble, you want to go with about a 10% pickup on water. And then you want to do a 0.9% pickup on salt, a 0.15% pickup on black pepper. If you're going to use onion and garlic powder, take that at 0.3%. If you want to add some chili, take that at about 0.5%, maybe some cumin, do that at about 0.2%. And so that's, it's sort of this, like this side of memorization meets that scientific formulation. Whereas recipes to me now, I think of them as formulas and not, you know, take a cup of this and a teaspoon of this and a pinch of that. I could never, I could never survive with what I do. So by using percentages, you can then very easily scale up to a massive sized you know, batch, if you will, which is what we would call, you know, that's our batch sheet would be a big, big recipe for, let's say like a hundred thousand pounds for the day. What? And so, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I, I've created, I, you go into any Kroger supermarket and any of their, you know, subsidiaries that Kroger is the big umbrella company for, I could point to about 20 different items in their stores that I've created for them to sell. And so a lot of that are their raw marinated meats. Well, they have like 3,200 stores in the country and we're making those raw marinated meats for them to sell. So on a weekly basis, we have to keep that stock replenished. We're nothing, by the way. I work for a very small company and the scale at which I see raw meat moving through my facility still to this day, six years I've been with them in August, still blows my mind that there's that many animals out there. Right. And we're not Tyson. We're not Cargill. We're not these monolith, you know, just entities in my industry that put us to shame. I mean, really, the, the goal for any company like mine is just to be a thorn on their side just long enough for them to get a little annoyed and be like, here, we're buying you to yeah. shut you up. Right. And I, I can barely process that, like I said, that there's this much raw material out there for us to use, let alone however many other companies like me exist out there and all the big companies on top of all that. It's, it, it's beyond comprehension. Man, that does not sound sustainable. Wait, so there's two, there's two things that we just talked about. What, what is a pickup? But I, yeah, I totally – I kind of went off there a little bit. No, no, no. Pick, this is what I want. A pickup – no, I know. But a pickup would be – a pickup would be when I say like a 10% pickup on the weight of the raw material. So the weight of the raw material for that recipe I gave you would be 453 grams is approximately a pound. And that's the weight of the raw chicken, let's say. So a 10% pickup on that would be you taking 453 times 10%. And now you have that amount of water that you'd want to start with as the base for your marinade. So as long as you know the weight of your raw material, every other number that I gave, the 0.25%, 0.15%, 0.3%, you're just taking that and multiplying that into the weight of the raw material. And that gives you a very and, – and look, it, I'm not giving you anything specific. I just know after this much time using some ingredients as often as I have – I just know that like a 0.9% pickup on a raw marin for a raw marinated meat, that's a pretty good amount of salt. There's a very fine threshold that you want to hit for your salt flavor. Now, depending on whether or not there's salt and other ingredients that you may choose to use, you would adjust that. But if the only salt that you're going to add to something comes from that specific one ingredient, 
0.9% pickup on the raw material is a pretty safe bet. And so it's kind of silly because like I said to the average person, they're going to hear me say that and just think that's crazy. I don't understand it. But after enough times of just, you know, making thousands of recipes and you know, how, how, how many hundreds of different flavored marinades I've developed over the years, you just know that, okay, in my head, I'm going to start with these numbers and then I can reevaluate as I start to develop the formula. Right. And so that, that's sort of the pickup. All right. Well, but, you just, you just hit another one of my questions though. Okay. Uh, salt. What kind of salt are you using when you're just saying salt? Is that just, just table salt, dude? Yeah. So I, I wish it wasn't. Yeah. But yeah. I shouldn't say I wish it wasn't because, you know, I, I think when I say that you can sympathize or understand with where I'm coming from there. But again, if people say, what kind of food do I make? I make American food mm-hmm. and, you know, and like that's a, that's a national palate and the national palate doesn't want Himalayan pink salt. That may be the only salt that I use at home. It may be the only salt that I use to cook food for myself in my kitchen, even at the office. But I, I can't put that in a recipe that's going to go in somewhere and have them, you know, afford it or be excited that that's an ingredient. You may have the buyer that uses it at home themselves, but everybody has to understand the financial constraints of the consumer. And while those ingredients sound great and may have the nutritional benefits that realistically the general public needs at this point, it's just not feasible. And so there's been a choice few recipes where I've been able to use sea salt because there's so few ingredients that I can build that into the cost. But for the most part, it is, you have to go as generic and, and unfortunately as cheap as possible with the majority of those sorts of things. Right. You're using salt as, as uh, both a chemical component and as a flavor component in this case, and then I would assume that for the majority of these applications, if you were to use salt in a way, uh, any other salt, you would be doing it so that people, not just not just because of this mineral content that's good for you and whatever, but also so that you see it on the label. And that's that maybe that that North California, um, oh yeah, Kroger population or something. Okay, well, yeah, you have, and they have, you know, like there's a lot of supermarkets out there. Costco's a, Costco's a great example where like. Everything I develop for them, I try to keep it around 350 to 400 milligrams per serving because that's not on the high end by their standards. And that's sort of a generic number that if I'm able to get in front of a buyer and say, hey, I have all these items, you know, it's a plethora of different flavors and ingredients that I've used. But everything that you're about to taste, I've made sure I've hit this sodium mark. Sodium is still a really hot trigger for a lot of people out there. Um, Interesting. Regardless. Uh, of regardless of, yes, for sure. And it, Sure, because of blood pressure. But you have to remember that we live we live in a society in which the consumer base is sort of obsessed with microchemical terminology that it really has no idea of. They don't under no understanding of rather. Give me some examples. And so, well, I'm, and I'm totally stealing this from uh, In Defense of Food, which is a Michael Pollan book that I read. And after I read it, I was like, oh, this totally makes sense. But the best example that he uses is that I can completely see parallels with what I do now is walk down the cereal aisle and you can pick up any box of, you know, neon colored sugary cereal, but it's going to have health claims on the front about, you know, whole grains and lowering cholesterol. And, but what, no one knows that go to the average person that's going to buy anything in the supermarket and say, Hey, give me a definition of cholesterol. They're not going to, they're going to have nothing for you. And so while yes, sodium, for example, is, you know, because of blood pressure, Nobody, and I don't want to say nobody because I know that I should never use absolutes, but I'm going to say the majority of both the buyers, the marketing teams, the executive boards, the consumer base, the managers, the, you know, everybody that's involved, that's over their head. And so here, this is it. The perfect example is gluten-free. Okay. I have friends that have kids and I was at a friend's house and she pulled out uh, a loaf of bread. And she said, look, I, I got my kids this. It's healthier. It's gluten-free. And I said, why is it healthier? And she said, it's because it's gluten-free. And I go, but why is gluten unhealthy? Well, I heard it was. And I said, well, what is gluten? Well, I don't know, but I heard it's, I just, you know, it's not good for you. And I, and it, then I really had to break down, like, here's what gluten does. Here's how long it's existed in the world. And then let's look at the ingredient statement of what you've got. Then instead of using gluten, It's using concentrated amounts of refined starches. And so where potato starch is your lead ingredient, 
if you and I go out into nature as Homo sapiens evolved over you know millions of years, and in the time period in which potatoes existed, potato starch existed, and where that group of people is eating potatoes, they're eating potato starch, but they're also eating a lot of other components in that potato that are helping metabolize that starch and process that starch and absorb that starch and do things with that starch. Now, if you take all those other components away and all you have is that one component in heavy doses, that's super high on the glycemic index. It's not good for your body at all. It actually, it, you might as well just drink the soda or just eat all the sugar at that point because of what it's doing internally. But no one knows that. They just know gluten-free. Well, gluten-free is healthy. And so that's one that I, I get pretty fired up about because it still seems to be lingering a little bit longer than I wish it was. But that's a good example of, you know, it can be sodium. It can be, you know, low fat. It can be, you know, lower sugar. It can be gluten-free. It, it doesn't matter. I have, you know, when I went back and became a nutritionist and really dug into that side of food and, and really, I'd say more where my passion lies than anything else. You know, it was it was as beautiful of, as it was to obtain that knowledge and understanding for so many of the more esoteric areas of, you know, food, quote unquote. It really showcases the shortcomings and the manipulative nature of packaging to the just general consumer base because they're just being bombarded, like I said, with this terminology that they just have no understanding of. And and they're just supposed to trust whoever's printing it to tell them, hey, this is the way, follow us. But that's never worked out for anybody when it comes to food. For a lot of things. Well, so have you ever had an opportunity to, to design a product for nutrition specifically? I have had opportunities to sort of be sneaky about it. <laughs> and... Sneak in the vegetables? <laughs> yeah. Slide broccoli into things? I mean, and I really try to... <sighs> I try to bring that to the table anytime I present anything. And I, you know, I'll, I'm going to use an example of there is a company, they, and they no longer exist. They were bought out, but they were called Delmonico Foods. Oh, yeah. And the owner's name was Tony Delmonico, who's a great friend of mine. Uh, they, they just got absorbed into a company called Kettle Cuisine. And Kettle's great. And Delmonico's still there as a brand, but they don't, but they're part of Kettle now. And so the thing was when I, when I first started working on, you know, as soon as we started to get some momentum at a bigger scale, we had to come to terms really quick with the things that we could do and the things that we're not. And so for example, like we're not a seasoning company and we're not a sauce company. Now I very, very, very first started, I was designing my own seasoning blends and then I would send my formulas to spice companies and they would match my blends and then we would purchase mass quantity from them. Same with sauces. But as we got bigger, it just became a little bit too much of a pain to, hey, you know, we have a customer that's looking for something like this. Okay, well, let me take all this time to work on these sauce recipes, whereas I have a general idea of the flavors I want to hit. So I can go to a sauce company that I trust and say, look, I really need you to make me something like this, or I need a low sodium gluten-free teriyaki sauce. It's way easier for them to come up with something on their end, given the equipment and the, you know, academic background that they have when it comes to sauce production and then send me those samples the same way I would go to a buyer with different things that I've created. This is wild. So wait, the, the spice and sauce category of what you do is specialized to the extent that it's a little bit out of your depth. Is that, is that what I'm getting? It's not that it's out of my depth. It's that let's, let's see like this, uh, spice companies that I work with, I could go to them and I can say, Hey, you have an R and D team the same way I run R and D for my company. Okay. I want you to go as a sales rep. I'd like you to go to your R and D team who just like me every day is creating various recipes or trying different things or having fun with new ingredients. Go to your R&D team and I want you to ask them what they're excited about that they've developed. Whatever their answer is, I'd like you to send me samples of that because I'd like to see what they're working on. And so they may send me a pound of three or four or five different spice blends that have, you know, some of them have some funky names or they've got, you know, different global flavor profiles that they're trying to meet. But once I have those, now if I default back to that base level of, okay, I'm going to make a raw marinade for chicken, 
I can take that seasoning blend that they sent me. I can just throw it on chicken. I can make a marinade. I can taste it. And then I can go back to them and say, hey, I think you're on to something, but I need you to bump up these notes and then I'd like to see it again. And then I can manipulate it on my end to fit what I want, you know, both A, to my palate and B, to sort of fit what vision I may have for that flavor now. And so where there's plenty of times where I can just say, hey, you know, I need to season this with five or six things. I could just use five or six ingredients off my pantry and off my shelf and just make it myself. If I'm looking for a, you know, a, a coconut green curry seasoning, but I want, you know, heavier chili notes and, you know, I don't really want much garlic. I can just go to a seasoning company and say exactly what I just said. And they can just be like, OK, here you go, bud. There's your seasoning. Have fun. And then I can try it and say, OK, look. You know, I know I said this, but it's a little bit too earthy. I need you to sweeten it a little bit, but I don't want you to just use sugar. Can you use some honey powder instead? Yeah, we can make that up. Okay, here's a new blend. Try this now. And so the same way that we make money off creating the finished entrees for, you know, your supermarket or for your restaurant, there's people that are making money off of what I'm creating because I may be using their seasonings or their sauces in my formulas. So you've mentioned a couple things in there like – flavor related things. And I would imagine that in the same way, when you're working on a recipe, you have to deal with the body of the uh, recipe. So in the example of like the gluten-free bread, we've re we replaced the gluten protein with, with some starch that's some concentrated thing. Um, and that is serving a couple purposes, but maybe bread's a little too complicated for this example. But what I want to ask is like, what are the functional categories of ingredients that you work with when you're developing a commercial food product? So like, for example, uh, thickeners or like things okay. that make food more wet or like m less loose or something. Are that, am I close? No, you're, I get you. And dude, let me tell you that there is, there have been plenty of times where I have to turn to who I would consider experts in those fields to really make sense of it. And bread is a fine example because we're talking about refined starches. And when it comes to starches, I'm not a starch expert. I don't know all the functionalities of starches. <laughs> That's going to be the call out from this show. I'm not a starch <laughs> expert. But I'm telling you, my man, if you call – uh, what, what are they? They used to be called national starch. I think they're called ingredient now. And if <laughs> I call my rep at ingredient, ingredient, dude, there's like 12,000 different types of starches out there. Oh my gosh. And, and how many of them, how many of them are naturally occurring and how many of them are like, uh, I couldn't isolates. even tell you that, but I can okay. tell you that I only need like three or four in my kitchen to do everything I need. But you have to think like there's, there's starches that are only used in candies. You know what I mean? There's starches that are used in breads. There's starches that are used like, I was, I was working on a taco meat recipe for a restaurant and I got the flavor right and I got the texture right. And I got the, you know, they, the, the moisture levels were appropriately, you know, just, you know, in place so that it could sit on a hotline for 90 minutes at a time. But you know, the, the restaurant group said, well, we, we want it to look more shiny. I'm like, oh. Oh, let me, let me take that back to my kitchen. Like, what do I do at that point? I want it to look more shiny. Well, I happen to talk to my starch rep and they're like, oh, well, you should use this starch instead. And I go, Wait, why? That's going to add shine. Oh yeah. That's more for our gravies. So it gives it that like shiny sheen that you would expect a gravy wow. to have. Wow. And I was like, let me see it. And so they sent it and that is exactly what it did. And I used it and I sent it back and they're like, you got it. Perfect. And now it's in stores all over the country. Wow. <laughs> like that's, and it's still there. And I've developed three other items for their menu and I've used the same starch because now I know that's what their buying group's looking for. They want shine. You know, they're going for aesthetics as they much as much as they are, you know, any other aspect that, that comes into play. And so I keep that shine on those. But that's one of twelve thousand starches that are out there that I could potentially use. And now I just know that, hey, I couldn't tell you the chemical makeup of this. It's a modified tapioca starch. I don't know how they modified tapioca to make it, but at the same time, I know it adds shine if I add it to something. So there it wow. is. It's per I'm going to hold on to that one. Wow. Do you do you go out to eat at the places where you've got items on the menu? Um, I, it depends. Uh, I I will say that the uh, the sad truth is that you know, given 
I think given my academic background, given the personal sort of life that I live on a, on the healthy athletic front, um, there is a lot of stuff that I've created that I don't necessarily want to eat. Right. And that makes sense. You know, and it's not, I don't mean that as anything negative towards the formula because I, I send food home to my father on a, you know, bi-monthly basis to keep his freezer stocked for him. And right. I'm, I'm fine to feed it there. It's just, I, when I, when I started culinary school after college, I had a couple things working for me. I had two bachelor's degrees and I was older than everybody else there. So I had, I had an academic discipline already developed as far as how to approach schoolwork. So whereas I'm 24 and I'm in a classroom with a bunch of 18, 19 year olds, I was able to sort of approach it more comfortably and I didn't have to let ego get involved. So immediately in that classroom setting, you see the pretentious nature of the quote unquote chef start to present itself. And I'm disgusted by that. And I want nothing to do with it at the time and even still today. And so I have a very simple palate. I'm, I'm not pretentious when it comes to food. I love dining out. I love exploring menus. I usually tend to order the, you know, the silliest or funniest or weirdest astounding thing on the menu, which is usually a disappointment, but I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of into exploring the different sides of it all. But no, I was, that's part of the reason why I had to accept early on that I wasn't, I wasn't made to work in restaurants was because I just wasn't willing to, I wasn't willing to have that edge. I didn't want to be mean to my service staff. And I worked as a sous chef in a restaurant where, you know, a guy made jokes about wanting to make the waiters and waitresses cry. And it got to a point one day where he did something and I didn't like it. And I stood up for the server and tried to shut him down. And, you know, he turned on me and you're not allowed to do that. You can't talk to me like that. We're supposed to have each other's backs. And I just started laughing and I was like, I kind of circled my fingers around and I was like, you see all this, these walls, you can take it, dude, take it or leave it. It's yours. I don't want this. I just need to get a title on paper as quickly as possible. So then I can figure out what I really want to do with all of this education, this professional sort of experience that I've started to create here. And, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, it is what it is. I think some people have it and some people don't. And I was in New York working hundred hour weeks, you know, going months at a time without a day off. And I did it and I paid my dues and I, I probably took a few years off my life at the same time, but the light at the end of the tunnel was just, I just have to become an executive chef as quickly as possible so that I can leave and, and never really try to do this again. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, you, you kind of answered the question there, but it's, it seems like, uh, you've come to this, uh, philosophy about food that, um, is informed in part by y- your you're getting into the food preparation part of things after a whole bunch of kind of context was already under your belt. But it seems to me like, and you tell me if you agree or not, that like you are, are looking at food from a, from a certain, uh, maybe a higher vantage point than, than people who are in um, restaurants are in the sense that they're looking one hundred percent at the plate in front of them and at the room that they're serving and oh yeah maybe about the peers that they see in the in the in the in the restaurant industry but you're kind of looking at food on a on a much larger scale that encompasses the commercial and the industrial um, and the kind of chemical side of food uh, in a way where it's what like it's it's nourishment well, it's, a, it's a pro and a con I mean it's a, it's a commodity you know that's what food is in my mind at this right. point. And it's a pro and a con coming out of the restaurant side of it all. Uh, again, there's not – I don't meet a lot of people in my field now that have the restaurant experience that I have. Uh, the Where it helps me is that I'm very keen to the idea that you eat with your eyes before you eat with your mouth. And so I know that the food needs to look good. And the reality is, is any supermarket you go into and buy my food, it's coming in a plastic bag. And there's – you know, that's, it's not going to be beautiful, but it can be better than the competition. And so when I first came in, I went out and I bought all the competition's foods and I don't need to throw their names out there because, you know, if, if you do enough research and you see what I create, go to that part of the supermarket and you'll see who I'm surrounded by, but it's crap. And it was then, and it still is now. And the problem was, is that because they rested on their laurels of people don't know what we're doing. 
There's no real understanding about how this side of the industry works. And we can use all these cheap ingredients and take all these shortcuts with your emulsifiers and your thickening agents and your refined starches. And no one really knows because they can't read these ingredient statements and make sense of it. And so they were just putting shit product on the shelf and people just got very accustomed to buying it. Mediocrity became the norm. And so I came in and I bought all those up and I'm eating them and I'm this just garbage. And so I took all of their packaging and I literally tacked it up on the wall in front of me and I called it the wall of death. And I was like, I'm going to kill every one of these recipes. I'm going to just, that was where I started. I'm going to go comfort food and I'm going to go line by line on this little, these little columns that I built with your packaging. And I'm going to make a better version of what you sell. And so one of the first things I did was going after meatloaf. And so I made a turkey meatloaf that immediately went into Costco's. And then I made stuffed chicken breasts and they immediately went into Costco's. And then they go into Kroger's. And then, you know, it could be your Thai coconut curry chicken or your Moroccan chicken. So I took that restaurant side of understanding how to create something that looks really good. And luckily for me, I was able to take that and make it into something that was easily replicated on that massive scale in production. Now, the flip side of it, though, is that when you work in restaurants, let's go back to New York for me, you have other people from other restaurants coming in. And so there is this like unspoken competition. And even though it's very friendly, because if you come into my restaurant, I'm going to hook you up with some free stuff because I want to make you happy. I want to see, I want you to see what I'm doing. But I know that when I go into their places, they're going to do the same thing for me. And that's wonderful. There's none of that with what I do now. And because I sort of lost that now when I'm home and I'm, or at the supermarket and I'm buying food without that competition sort of motivating creativity just for me by myself. And I'm single. So when I cook, I'm just making food for myself. I don't necessarily go to the market or, or I'm not the proverbial like chef from food network walking up and down the aisles of the, of the farmer's market, like picking up these fresh ingredients and smelling them and like romanticizing all the wonderful things I can do. It's sustenance. I have to eat. And I, and I make food every day for everybody else in the country. And so when I finish and I go to the gym and I come home, food is a commodity and I have to feed myself and I need to put the right things in there and the right fuel to keep going and maintain the pace that I've had to live out for so many years. And, you know, it kind of is what it is at that point. And so, you know, the, I guess the closer to all of that would be, you know, like, Hey, let's get on one of these dating apps and swipe it a few times. Okay. I got a match. And the first thing is like the first thing the girl wants to say is like, Hey, what are you going to cook for me? And I was like, I don't really think you understand what I do. I don't think you want me to cook for you. If you know what I have to cook every day. (laughs) What's your feeling on Soylent? I think that it's inevitable that the masses are going to have to accept changes to their diets. Is Soylent the answer? Probably not. I think they're way ahead of their curve, but I've read enough interviews with the gentlemen and the individuals that have started it that they know they are. I mean, they are hedging their bets on a scale in which I I don't understand because I don't know their vision well enough. But they know that they aren't going to make their money right now. They just think they're going to make it in the future. The reality is somebody is going to make money in the future off of protein alternatives. It is not sustainable. And you know, the problem even on a larger scale is, you know, it's like, okay, well, it's not sustainable to raise beef the way we are. Well, now everybody wants to eat grass fed. Well, grass fed takes more land and more resources and releases more, yeah, more carbon into the atmosphere than just commodity farming. And so that's not the answer either. And so that's why you have Tyson investing huge amounts of monies in companies like Beyond Meat. Mm-hmm. That's why you have the Impossible Burger making its way onto restaurant menus. Have you tried these things? Have you tried the meat alternative? I have. Uh, I've tried. What were your impressions? I have. They're very interesting. <laughs> I think some of them are brilliant. I think, you know, but again, let's take a step back and be objective. Hey, everybody, we're not going to be able to supply the palate and the growing population with the amounts of meat in which we have forever. But let's make all these protein alternatives that still look like meat. Yo, yeah. I get it. 
But at the same time, it's like if you can't eat meat, just why are we trying to trick ourselves? Like that's just, what that's what I've always thought about vegetables. Fake fake meats, uh, even you know that aren't driven by that kind of sustainability mindset. But for vegetarians that are, you know, not necessarily ethical vegetarians, but just turned off by meat or, or, or nutritionally or whatever, they're always eating these terrible fake meat. I know it doesn't. I know, anyway. and uh, you know, I think that there's. <sighs> But there's a transition thing. To it for sure. And it, it's going to take a long time. And I will tell you that one of the coolest things that I'm working on right now is um, a restaurant asked me to come up with a vegetarian taco meat. Mm. And I got excited because I was like, oh, cool. This is this is something that I don't normally get asked. This will be fun to work on. What really got me excited was that she told me she wanted it to be grain based. And when I heard that, I was like, there we go. Is that like I Satan? Don't want no, dude, I'm going to use like, I'm using wheat berry, quinoa, mm. barley. Oh, okay. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying buckwheat. I'm trying rye berries. I'm trying, I mean, I have, I made about 10 different blends of grains the first time around. And I came up with a couple that I was happy with. One of them has lentils in it. And, uh, I sent samples off to the R and D team last week for the first round so that they could taste them and give me some feedback on it. Um, there's a lot of testing that's going to have to come into play. Will the consumer be receptive to it? You know, the reality is, I, I not to just sound totally pessimistic, but probably not. It's really out there when it comes to taking a, a Mexican restaurant and telling like, hey, this is – but I don't know. I don't you know, know man. Hugo's, it sounds like New York. It'd be a, it'd be a hit. <laughs> yeah, and Hugo's in Southern California has a uh, – oh, what do they use? They have a vegetarian taco meat that you can use too that's not anything – too funky and it's been on there for a while but hold on go back to your go back to your you know your uh, protein substitutes the majority of what's popular right now to make those is pea protein and when people hear pea protein they think of green peas it's not where that's coming from it's coming from a, the bark of a very certain type of tree that can only be grown in cold weather climate what and why is so, it called pea protein <clears throat> is that a marketing thing uh, I don't know if it's a if it's a pea tree. I don't really know the details on the plant there's itself. There's no such thing as a pea tree. <laughs> exactly right. But I do know this: there's a shortage, and so you oh. already have the same issues where there's not enough trees out there to supply the demand that these new pea protein meat substitutes are already looking to fill. It's like the and, cashmere of of, yeah. of proteins. And it's not even just beef and chicken now. There's seafood companies that are doing it too, making you know pea protein based tuna and salmon substitutes. I mean, it's what a trip. It's, you know, it's I think the tech I, industry, dude. I've got heard the same thing about uh, quinoa too. That uh, you know the the That's indigenous tough. peoples that eat quinoa in, in northern South America can no longer afford quinoa. Just kind of like coffee growers can't really afford to drink coffee. Oh my uh, god, I believe it because yeah, they really I mean, need to sell it. You know, like it's not that they can't afford it. It's just that you know they could be a subsistence farmer that's growing only enough to eat and nothing else, or they can sell it and have cash and then be part of like the globalized economy. And right. again and again and again, indigenous peoples confronted with that option, choose, choose to participate in the global economy and sacrifice the, uh, their, their kind of rightful and, and traditional, uh, heritage, uh, in order to participate. And that's a thing that I think like is kind of the weird flip side of that coin of, of the globalism thing is like, you know, it's really easy from the outside to, it's almost condescending to like look at an indigenous people and be like, no, 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 you know, trust us, like stay, stay real, you know, like be you yeah. and don't, don't come in here. Cause like, you're going to lose your identity. It's almost like Neil Gaiman's like impression of, of heaven is, is like losing your identity and joining, joining this kind of, uh, uh, That's a brilliant example. Soothing kind of global, uh, but but identity free uh, pool. That's kind of what it is to to step into globalism. But it's it's almost impossible to tell an indigenous group once they've been exposed to the global economy that they can't participate because they're like, how about I get some cash and then I can have medicine and like my kid can have an education yeah, no lie. and have an alternative uh. to growing fucking quinoa, which is not what I would choose to do. You know, <laughs> and I think it can only be grown in Peru, by the way. What's your feeling on GMOs? Oh, I know that's a big question, again, but it's, it's related to this whole thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's so funny. I think that's one of the it's one of the triggers right now that, you know, like where I said the sodium content earlier, GMOs is another one that certain buyers get really stuck on 
or certain uh, restaurant groups get stuck on the where they want to avoid. Whereas again, the reality is it's not really possible not to. And especially on that level, because like, look, anything on that level is going to use soybean oil and you're not going to get the soybean oil if you're not using GMO. So even if you tell me to create something that's not using GMO ingredients, you're probably still cooking it with GMO soybean oil inside your kitchens at your restaurant anyways. So it's just like game they're playing with themselves at the same time. And you, you have to appease it, but it's very difficult to source on a big level. Um, it's okay if you're, you know, the small restaurant that can source out of local farms and walk over to Union Square to get your ingredients every morning. But well, not every morning, but when you have your farmers markets out there. But it's, uh, I, I don't have a problem with it. I think it's, you know, it's you have to be objective, and it can be your high fructose corn syrups or it can be your GMOs. It's there, and it's not going anywhere. And so you can huff and puff all you want, and you can make the claims all you want, but it's not going anywhere. And the reality is, again, if we want to feed the people that are on this planet and the way the populations are growing, these sorts of things have to happen. Love Monsanto or hate Monsanto, they are a necessary evil in the world right now because without the research that they're doing – there's just going to be a mass die off. Like it, it, you, there won't be enough food for the people that need it. And I mean that even with what I just said, if the wrong person or the right person hears those words, I mean, they're going to be on the other side of their speaker, just up in arms because the tangents that you can go off of that one statement, I get it. I know that we produce way more food than we feed our country and how much milk and dairy is, is wasted from what we grow and how many more people can be fed. I get all that. It's so complex. But if you're just going into the microcosm of, of genetically modified, do I wish that there was a, a way in which we didn't have to do that? I would hope everybody would answer that question with yes. Do I think it's possible though? No, I do not. I think it has to happen. It totally makes sense to me. I mean, I think that we, we're kind of having this issue right now with with the readily available dirty energy that is – uh, a natural resource uh, owned in a certain sense, and as much as any of them are, by developing countries like India or China or the Philippines or whatever, where they could be burning coal or its local equivalent and developing as developing countries do, and their quality of life, you know, could be improving, and they could be pulling their populations out of poverty, but. We as a country that's already burned more than our share of fossil fuels and has exactly. the luxury of moving on to alternative energies is now telling them, no, 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 you can't do that. And exactly. I get it. They shouldn't. I, ideally, they should not. But it's really hard to tell somebody who's grinding in poverty, don't burn that dirty coal in order to heat your meal or don't burn that coal in order to burn the one light bulb in your house, you know, because there's a billion of you and we can't do that. We already blew our coal wad. We ruined it for everybody. Now exactly. you guys need to wait until solar technology is affordable. Uh, or, and in the meantime, don't develop. Uh, and the, the same with the food is like those exactly. countries that you said exactly. Think of like the – one of the best examples is golden rice. It's like yes. we Who's sit here Who's comfortable guy? in the States – I thought that I couldn't even tell you the, the person behind it. I just know it as the as the food substance. But I always just thought even – and you don't really hear, hear it being talked about too much anymore. But I remember when the argument first happened, if that was a few years ago, I just thought like we're, we're able to go to Whole Foods. Like – and I, I, I understand. I'm very privileged in the way in which I get to eat and the lifestyle that I get to live. I never neglect to recognize that. But when I can go to Whole Foods – and I can sit there and pick through, you know, a, even better example. I was at Sprouts yesterday and I wanted a lemon and I wanted an organic lemon to make juice with, with my juicer at home. And I pick up one of the lemons and it has a little bit of mold and the guy comes up behind me and he goes, no, 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 don't buy those here and opens up the box that's full of like 50 more lemons. And I was like, no, dude, I was like, I, I, I could probably, no, 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 those are all trash now. I have to get rid of them. You buy these ones. And I'm like, wow, like that's just trash. Like we're just, just throw it away, dude. No big deal. But then at the same time, the little voice in my head is like, yeah, but we're the same people as, you know, Westerners quote unquote, or however developed or however you want to say it, they're going to be up in arms about genetically modified when it comes to golden rice, they could offer nutritional benefits that 
are on a bioavailable level to these people that have that, that don't have it elsewise. You know, so it's like why it's just. Again, I'm going to get all fired up if I talk about it too much. I get frustrated, though. <laughs> I, I get it. It feels it feels very patronizing it's, or, or condescending. It it's and, just stupid. Like, let them, let them, if, if there's a way to help these people, and and, I, and these people sounds terrible to say probably <laughs> too, but, but if there's a way to feed peoples of the world that don't have any other alternative and these genetically modified foods can offer them something that they aren't able to have, I take a trace – trace mineral supplement on a daily basis because I'm worried about the soil in which my food is grown in being mineral deficient. Now, that is nothing in comparison to other parts of the world. Where they're eating one starch every day and nothing else. Just eating yucca. Just that's it. it. The flip side to all of it is, hey, let's be up in arms about GMOs, but we've been genetically modifying foods for millions of years. Maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, that's Potatoes came out of Peru, okay, but potatoes are all over the world now, and it's not – any food that you look at has been changed over and over and over from tomatoes to potatoes to different types of onions. I mean there's a reason why that's happened, and a lot of it has been because different men and different women in different cultures throughout time have been able to take farming practices in different directions and make changes to what they want to eat to fit the, fit the climates that they're in or fit the soil that they're in. And, that's the same thing. It's just not happening with people with lab coats on. It was happening out in nature, which people seem to, you know, they, they're they okay with that. <laughs> the natural thing is a, is a whole uh, yeah. other ball of yarn too. Natural is not even a real word. <laughs> I, I, um, I know. I know. Oh, man, I've been harping on that one since I was like nine. Um, there's so we're, we're, we're just passing the one hour mark, and I got to say, like, I really <laughs> – the questions that I had, you, you, you touched on so many of them in the – in your opening statement that I, and, and so many of the questions that I, that I had for you, we only scratched the surface, but dude, I, I still th- never told you what a tumbler is. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I have it written down in front of me with an arrow written and uh, no, there's a million things, but I, 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 I tell you what, so this is a new podcast. Um, uh, when, when you and I are talking now, I have yet to put out any of the episodes. Uh, you're the third interview that I've recorded, but you, I haven't told you this, but the conversation, uh, that you and I had, that Cody and I had at uh, our, our dear friend's wedding, uh, I don't know, like three years ago or something like that, four Madonna years ago. Madonna Inn in the, Carpinteria. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> was the conversation that s- planted the seed that grew into the germ that eventually became this show, I oh, decided awesome. to do this podcast on the back of the kind of fascination and like mental pyrotechnics that that conversation set off in my head. That's really cool. Uh, yes. Uh, Cody and I spoke for, I don't know, like a half hour or something like this at this wedding. And since then, I have been thinking about how um, there's this uh, unbelievably rich world uh, inside people's specialties. Uh, if you can only convince them that nothing is boring, that's the name of the show. This is like one of those movies where they say the name of the show in the, or the, there it the is. movie. In the movie. <laughs> nothing is boring. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, you are, you know, you do want to kind of draw them out and like hear what it really is like to do their job. So, uh, with that said, uh, this has been fantastic and everything I hoped it would be. And I hope, uh, that I can hold on to the things that I did not get out of you. And maybe you will be the first repeat guest on this show at a later date. Uh, And we'll continue. People are, uh, if people are into it, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking about it. I'm, I'm well aware of the fact I, I always say there's not many of me out there when it comes to what I do and it doesn't matter who I get in front of. I, I mean, really you just have to tell people you're a food scientist and immediately they're just like, what, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> tell me more. And then when I really get into what I do, then people really are, are inst- instantly pretty intrigued. So if there's more room there, man, I would love to come back. I'd love to have another conversation with you. Fantastic. This has been fantastic. And also our first phone or interview. So let's hope that this worked at all because they're well, literally- We have a recording three ways. So, so, <laughs> so we headed our bets here. We should be good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I've, I've had these things go awry. Anyway, Cody Masters, thank you so much. Fantastic.
one, Cody Masters. The audio quality was not great, I'm not gonna lie. It felt uh, a little weird to be dealing with such a horrible quality recording as a guy that professes to know a thing or two about that. I am a little embarrassed <laughs> by how that came out. And when I'm speaking to you now, I've already recorded about five more interviews of varying audio quality. It's going to go up and down. Uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm of the mind that uh, you should meet people to do to do the interview wherever they're most comfortable, whether that's over the phone or in their studio or whatever it is, and not sweat the the audio quality too much if that means you can engage with somebody. And so it's going to go up and down as I figure my stuff out. Please bear with me. So that's the first episode. That's it. Nothing is boring. Thank you so much for listening. Cody Masters, fascinating guy, nuanced guy, uh, has, a, has a challenging and important job that is is responsible for, for how a lot of people eat and how a lot of people perceive food. Once again, if you want to connect with me or give me feedback about the show, please reach out through the form at hardwork.party or follow me on the socials. Uh, that's on Twitter or Instagram at Hard Work Party. Uh, please subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please, if you like the show, leave us a five star rating on iTunes. It really helps other people find us. I am contractually obligated to say that our theme music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. I'm not obligated, but nonetheless elect to say that Breakmaster Cylinder is objectively tremendous. I'm going to try something out here. This is a segment I'm going to call Wikipedia Arcana. I'm going to hit you with a Wikipedia entry that shattered my mind. One that I hope is appropriate to the show. This one is the entry for Rootstock. Rootstock. Uh, but also deals with the notions of cereal grafting and family trees. Basically, the deal is this. You can get the aerial parts of plants, that's the part of a plant that's above ground, to grow on the roots or the rhizome of other plants, as long as they're relatively closely related. So this is something that's commonly done with grapes, but it could do with it could be done with any type of plant where you want the properties of an established root system, maybe drought tolerance, things like that, but you want the fruiting body or the uh, the leaving part or whatever it is uh, uh, of the aerial of the plant, you can basically cut one cut them, stick one on top of the other one. I'm going to read you an excerpt. The rootstock may be a different species from the scion. The scion is the part that gets grafted on. But as a rule, it should be closely related. For example, many commercial pears are grown on a quince rootstock. Grafting can also be done in stages. A closely related scion is grafted onto the rootstock and a less closely related scion is grafted onto the first scion. That's cereal grafting. So cereal grafting of several scions may also be used to produce a tree that bears s several different fruit cultivars. You could have one tree that has multiple different fruits on it with the same rootstock taking up and distributing water and minerals to the whole system. So those with more than three varieties are known as, quote, family trees. What? Please come back for the next episode. We're going to be talking to Adam Bailey, makeup and effects artist and Southern Gentlemen. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe. I love you. Smooches.